John chapter 6, verse 66. And from that time, many of his disciples went back. Yes. Anybody ever know someone that lived for God and went back? Yes. And walked no more with him. Everybody said they didn't walk with him anymore. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Let's lay our Bibles down. Let's lift up our hands and let's talk to Lord Jesus. We need you. The God, the, the, the God of this world, the, the, the mess of this world is taught wanting to get us to lean on our own understanding, to get involved in social programs, therapy, and shove drugs down our throat, God, when what we really need to do is go back to the beginning and walk with you. Help us to get that understanding this morning. Help us to, to reignite the passion for daily walking with the Lord, that we can avoid the pitfalls, the problems, and suffering failure at the hand of the world. And everybody said in Jesus name, amen. God bless you, you can be seated. Ecclesiastes reminds us that the race is not to the, the swift. And I'm sure most of us can remember the story or the fable of the tortoise and the hare. Dr. King once said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you got to keep moving forward. I want to walk with God. I want to walk with the Lord. Psalms 1, the beautiful psalm that talks about walking. It says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Careful who you let speak into your life. Careful what music you listen to and what programs. They call it a program for a reason that you pump into your heart and your mind uh, from that one-eyed square devil that's sitting in the corner of your house. Careful what you flip on on the radio and listen to. It's affecting who and what you are. It's affecting your walk. You don't believe me? Just ask that guy who's looking at another woman while he's got a beautiful, faithful wife sitting next to him. And he starts thinking that that looks better than what I got next to me. You see, half the stuff we face and deal with is self-inflicted. You listen to that somebody did somebody wrong song. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Let me tell you something. It's okay to be trying to reach sinners, but don't stand with them. Here's someone, someone posted something the other day. It don't matter what church we go to. We're not in gangs, but it matters how you leave a church. Your conduct matters. And be careful that you're not more worried about being friends with someone who's causing division and discord, which God's hate, and you're not a friend of God. You can, that's okay, that's preaching. First thing you'd say, you got some kid wanting to lead your other child away. I don't want you hanging around with them. Are you judging? Absolutely. Oh, I don't want you getting in the car with that guy. I don't want you running with that girl. Oh, well, you think it stops with us? Well, I don't know. I've seen our world. We're going to blame that all on the kids or some adults got to. Let's get real. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. You still love the word of God? You still enthralled by the word of God? And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Or when I can get off of Facebook. <laughs> when I get off the phone with all my friends. We wonder why sometimes our lives don't align with what the psalmist, and you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Some of you are more like that tumbleweed. You go where the wind blows. That bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Fruit is according to the root, and if you don't have a root, you'll have no fruit. Don't judge me. You don't know I'm judging you by your fruit. Uh, hello? Uh, see, I'm one of those guys. You know one of the most frustrating things on the planet? Avocados. 
Anybody, anybody with me on that? I like guacamole. I like it. I, I, you know, eh, you have to go in there. Eh, they're either too ripe, or you got to wait a week. You get that bad boy home, and you see go in there. And, what? I admit it. I have no more faith in them. I did something this week I've never done. I went and checked out all the avocados, and I got fed up. And I walked over to that pre-made guacamole, and God forgive me, I bought some. Yeah. We, were you culinary experts and people that understand that the greatest food on the planet is Mexican food? Yeah. Forgive me for buying. But, Brother Zico, please forgive me. I bought pre-made guacamole. Yeah, I did. I know. Father, forgive me for I have sinned. But I'm sorry. I'm tired of waiting on the avocados to align with my schedule. <laughs> hey, I want to know the fruit's got a root, and I'm going to be able to eat that fruit, right? Amen. His leaf also shall not wither. That was just free. I don't know why I even told you that. And whatsoever you do, it shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment. Don't, 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 don't confuse what God says is prosperous or what the world says. You may have everything in the whole world, but if, if according to God, you're not prosperous in him, you're not going to stand in judgment. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth, everybody say the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Job, who is the pinnacle of suffering, eloquently and boldly stated from a place of pain and trouble, but he knoweth the way that I take. Anybody know that? When he hath tried me, what, he's going to try me? Oh, yeah. He's going to find out who and what you really love. Stop a minute. Stop, stop and think about this for a minute. Don't, don't, don't rush through this because you want to, you, you want just some sort of word Nova came from the honesty of it. He's, he knows what you love. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps. Everybody say steps. That's what walking is. They're steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Anybody drawn back? Anybody gone back and walked no more with him? Well, you come to church, but that's just because you want to be saved, but you really don't want that walking relationship. Wait a minute now. And he makes something. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. This is a man who's the benchmark of pain. You know, when you read the Bible, when, when you talk about the heroes of faith, and we can go through the faith chapter and all that, but I'm not going to do that for a second time today. We never hear of what they owned or what they had. We hear of what they did. Let me help you. None of us are going to be, are going to be known for what we got. We're going to be known for what we gave. That's the benchmark. It, it, it is the rite of passage. If you become jaded with giving, if you get jaded with serving God, trust me, when you start thinking, oh, it's the church's responsibility and not your responsibility, you don't even know what the church is, and you've lost something along the way. Let me help you. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I don't have enough time to go over that sentence right, right there. But I'm going to go to Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, and I'm going to read something to you. Because I want to get each and everybody. I don't want running, jumping, and shouting, and all that. That's wonderful. I'm glad we have good services. I'm so thankful we have the power of God moving in. But I'll be honest with you. What really is going to separate the, the, the men from the boys and the ladies from the girls is those that are walking with God. Not used to walk, but are walking with God. Can two walk together except they be agreed? We always like to, 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 to put that with two people. But can we take that? You're not going to walk with God unless you're agreed. You're going to be upset somewhere. We'll get into that because there's all kinds of friends. There's different kinds of friends. 
But I'm talking about walking with the one that sticketh closer than a brother. Amos 3.3 in the English Standard Version says, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? The New King James says, that Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Let me flip this. What an opportunity. The living God wants to walk with you. You don't have to wait till you're in the hospital bed to try to find him. You don't have to wait till you're in, 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 a, in a ditch. You don't have to wait till you're on the front lines of a battle to get war religion. God wants to walk with you and talk with you every day. He's wanted to since the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3, 8, 9 says, And I heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the pool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said unto him, Where are you? Is that, is, that, is, that the, is that the sound in your life? Where are you? Well, no, not, not that you came to church, but have you come to him? Have you really yielded yourself and said, you know, God, I've tried it my way. I've done it my way. This, this world, I, 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 it's empty. It's full of empty promises. It's, it's leading me to destruction. You have to understand, just like the garden, the enemy of our soul wants to destroy that relationship with God. He wants to stop the walking relationship. He didn't want them walking in the cool of the day with the Lord. He wanted to do everything he could do to disrupt the walking, to destroy the talking. Walking and talking together involves agreement. Satan wants to cause division. He wants to separate man from his creator, his God. One of our greatest indicators of God's desire to walk with us is found in Genesis 5 and 24. There was a man and his name was Enoch and he walked with God and he was not for God took him. Genesis 5 and 24. In fact, the Bible goes on and says it twice about Enoch. It previously stated in Genesis 5 and 22, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. What a relationship that must have been. Walking may be a pastime for some of you. You may do it for health reasons. In fact, I, I read up on this this weekend. In fact, those people that walk increase their lifespan quite a bit. People that walk every day do something to their bodies, makeup and structure, that they're healthier, food tastes better, their mindset, their thinking, everything is improved by simply walking. I can't imagine what walking with God daily would do for all of us spiritually, what it would do for us emotionally, what it would do for us in our marriages and with our children. And, you know, the world's going to tell you how hokey this is. But yet the success rate in the world is astronomically pathetic. We've seen the destruction of the family unit. We've seen, we've seen the, the government approve certain drugs, and all of a sudden we wonder why our young people plummet in education and success. The world doesn't have the answers. Our creator still does. I want to walk with him. So walking may be a pastime for some, but walking with God must be a vocation for a man or woman of God. Those who are seeking the best that the Lord has for their life. We can see it's more than just a casual stroll or visit, more than a text or a phone call when you're walking with God. It's about honest intimacy and a relationship. Last night as I was studying and preparing uh, 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 for, for today, uh, Sister Crow was kind of doing her thing, and all of a sudden she decided to go over and sit next to me and interrupt what I was doing. What a wonderful interruption. I put my stuff down and I turned and I looked into her beautiful face and we talked for a little while. 
Because that's what walking with one another is. Why go through all that to have a home, to have cars, to have jobs, to have all, and not spend time with the one you love? And if it's that way with one another, how much more is it with our Creator? How much more is that to have a prayer life? It's a sad day when we can spend more time on social media and so little time in prayer. Facebook ain't coming to save you. Your Instagram could give a rip about you and you die, it'll cease, it'll stop. The accolades that you fill your house with, the things that give you social affirmation will mean absolutely nothing other than to be divided among those that are still here. Are you understanding the value of walking with God? It's evident through scripture that after the birth of his son Methuselah, Enoch got serious about following God. What event has to take place in your life to get your attention that you're finally going to really walk with God, to go all in and set all the trivialness and all the things aside and make God first and make God a priority and make uh, the end game important again. Are you hearing me? Hebrews touches on Enoch and says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God translated him. But before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Look around and ask your neighbor right now, are you pleasing God? Jude makes a statement in verses 14 and 16. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh when ten thousand of his saints do execute judgment upon all and convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which have ungodly, the ungodly have committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons, in admiration because of advantage. You're in a bad place when it's more important to impress those around you, not God. Be careful that we don't confuse our priorities. Those folk, folks were more concerned about their relationships with other people over their relationships with Almighty God. Now, this is a hard one to navigate because, you know what, you need to love your children. But sadly, we think giving our children everything the world has to offer is making us a good parent. But Jesus, the Lord didn't say that. The Lord said, raise up your children where you should go. Teach them in the morning about God. Teach them in the new time. Teach them at nighttime. But yet we live in a day to day when they're involved in every activity. They got every video game. They watch every program. They're involved in every sport. They're involved in every activity that the world has to offer. And you've got to. They're on another kind of drug that you gave them. It's that little square piece of carpet with a D on it. And they stand in the church on a D rug. You had to drag them to church and drag them to youth and drag. Because you taught them that God's just another activity. Don't think the advent of all the social media and activities it's just happenstance. Mm -hmm. If you're more concerned about your friends and relationships on Facebook than you are friends with God, you've, 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 you've missed something biblically and spiritually. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Enoch's departure is a type of pre-flood, pre-rapture. Your walking and vocation is not merely a leisurely activity. When you're walking with God and you call yourself a child of God, your life needs to reflect what God is saying because if it's saying anything else, you become a thief and a liar. You may be stealing and lying to your own family. You turn around and say, I got this God thing as I lead my family, but if you're not leading them in the way of righteousness, you're leading them... Enoch was the father of Methuselah who lived longer than anyone, 969 years, and it was the grandfather of Noah. 
This is not just coincidence or happenstance. Epitaphs are a statement that summarizes the life of someone in a nutshell. We, 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 we write stuff on, our, on, on tombstones. Now, I, I, I know there's controversy here, but I've seen the, the headstone of Billy the Kid in Fort Sumter. Now there's a fight over where his real grave is, but I digress. He lived as he, he died as he lived. Jesse James, murdered by a traitor and a coward. Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon. Benjamin Franklin, the father of the U.S. Constitution. Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb. Alexander the Great, a tomb now suffices for him whom the world was not enough. And little old Enoch, not on a tombstone, but stamped in the word of God. He walked with God. Abraham walked before God. Moses walked after God, but Enoch walked with God. All these biblical people show us that it's never too late. This is, this is what I want each and one of us to be encouraged by, each of us to get today. It's never too late in this life. To really start walking with God. I'm telling you right now, today can be that line of demarcation. It, it could be that thought, that space where you know what? I'm tired of being half measures and half stepping and just allow my opinion and ideas to get it. I'm going to go all in and walk with God. I want to just go ahead and let God be God. And I want to walk with him. I, I, I want to just give three quick reasons why Enoch was able to walk with God. It's not just as simple as getting up. And, he was careful about his companions. Let me help you. Light and darkness do not mix. Those people that are willing to fudge, be dishonest, mistreat, not take the word of God seriously, Tell tall tale, that kind of stuff. Be careful being too friendly. Light and darkness do not mix. Second Corinthians tells us in chapter 6, verse 14, and be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's kind of judgmental. Yeah. You ever walk into a restaurant and you can just smell the food poisoning? Man, I, I, I hate to break it to you. Any, okay, let me help. Anybody ever had food poison? Raise your hand. Because when you know, you know. You walk in, oh no. They be like, oh, come on, it's good, man. It's a greasy spoon. It's good. You go ahead. Take me to Walmart. I'll give me a veggie tray. Uh, Y'all hearing me? Why? Well, I don't care how good it tastes going down. There's a pain with it coming out. I don't want to go through that. We have to understand that this is spiritually true as well. Some of you have to be honest. Yes. What's coming out is proof you ain't eating good. The fruit shows there's no root. Are you hearing what I'm saying? For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? Be careful. I hear people, oh, I get along more with people in the world than I do with those in the church. That's like a job where saying, man, I get along with them prostitutes better than my own wife. I said it. Prove me wrong. And what communion have light with darkness? There's a difference between an acquaintance and a friend. Being friendly does not always mean being a close friend. There's all kinds of friends. There's people that can say, I know Brother Crow, but wait, hold on. Don't, don't drop my name unless I'm willing to say, okay. Psalm 1 and 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. I was at an event the other night, and I watched I'm just observant. I watch people. 
I didn't know the man of honor at that stuff, but I was with someone who did. And I could see subtly how some people wanted to get close to the man of honor, and I could see the benefits of all that. The benefits that he knew you, you might have a more prominent seat or whatever. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a day coming when it doesn't give a rip who you know, what you've done here. I hope you know the one there because there's a seating arrangement going to be there. There's going to be a table spread. There's going to be place setting. I don't know about you, but I want to make sure the King of Kings and the Lord of the knows who I am. And he's expecting my, my, and when I get there, my name is town. First Corinthians tells, be not deceived, evil communications or companion, companionship corrupt good manners. You will become who you hang around. There, there, there are some, and I, don't get me, don't get me wrong, as a pastor, and I, I think the reason, I, I love people. Man, I think people are interesting. I love to hear the stories. I love to hear people talk. I love to hear the background. I, I just, my, my, not, you know, no, brother, John, all because of you. I looked up and studied a bunch of stuff on Nigeria. People are cool. Man, it, it's incredible to, to, to sit down and... God loves you so much. The Bible says he loves you with an everlasting. People are cool. But God's great. Are you hearing me? Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Are you hearing me this morning? Now, this isn't mine, but I stole it because it was good. Someone once said, you have three types of people in your life. I've seen some where they say five, and some where they say seven. But we'll keep it down to three, because lunch is coming. Praise God for a pastor that loves me enough to let me go to lunch. First one are confidants. You're going to have very few of them. These are people who welcome you and love you unconditionally. They are into you, whether you're up, down, right, wrong. They're in your life for the long haul. They're not them fair weather friends. You know what I'm talking about. The kind that the uh, prodigal son had. As long as he had money, he had friends. Pump a lot of someone you can share anything with. And they're going to love you and they're going to help you. They're not going to run and tell somebody about you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That, that's why I think God is so frowns on gossip. You could have been a confidant, but you're a gossip. Having a good confidant is really one of the keys to unlock the dreams of your life. These are people you can share your deepest and darkest inner thoughts with. They won't judge you, but will feed you instead of draining you. I'm thankful. I'm going to tell you something. Someone asked me the other day, someone who's going through H E double hockey stick asked me, who are the men of God in your life? And I was so thankful to give them a good list. Nah, don't nod. But these are people I can tell everything about me, and they can correct me. They can look at me. No, Brother Crow, that's not right. I'm so thankful. I, I've got a bishop in my life that texts me every Saturday. We talk when we can. But he's praying for me. He's concerned for me. I got pastors that 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 I've been in them. I've held license and been in ministry longer than them. But man, they care and they love, and they're going to tell me the truth. People, you have to understand, some people will never really tell you the truth because they're more concerned about what they get from you than what they give to you. We'll get into that in a minute. But I'm thankful that I've got some confidants. Confidants will confront you. I'll be honest with you, your pastor needs to be able to confront you. If he can't, you're already in spiritual trouble. Are you hearing me? Your, your pastor will be a confidant. Most of you 
I've been around here long enough where he knows that's that way with me. We sit down and talk, and you know it stays with me. No, trust me, I don't want all your stuff. That is not let me, that is not an invitation. I had to stop someone really say, I don't want to know no more. No, I did. I, I don't want to know. I don't want to have to navigate that in my mind and my heart. That some stuff you 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 got to deal with that one. I'm gonna give you good advice. I'm gonna pray for you, but you keep that one in your pocket. I don't want that one. Confidence will get in your business. Why are why is your finances like that? What? Wait a minute. What are you doing over there? And your wife's over here. What are you doing here? And your husband. Wait, what are you doing with your kids? Why are you letting your daughter run with? Wait, why are you letting your son? What are you doing? They'll get in your face and tell you when you're wrong, but they're on your side no matter what. They'll never leave you. They'll never forsake you. They'll stand with you even when you're going down. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, now not everybody does because some of you may not have a confidant. You may have never had one. And I know I'm, I'm talking about realness right here. Because even if, even if you've had one in your life, you're blessed. That gets us to the next constituents. As a pastor, there are some people let me preach to them, but they won't let me pastor them. There's some kids that you're their parent, but they won't let you be their parent. You biologically help them be here, but they're not going to let you speak into their life. You see, constituents, they're not really into you, but they're into what you are for. They're for what you're for. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're for what they are for, they'll be with you. But don't ever think that they may be for what you are for, but they're not for you. Because if they meet somebody else that is more aligned with their agenda, they'll hook up with them and leave you. Some of us have experienced that in life. Mm-hmm. You don't make a constituent a confidant. Because by the time you fall in love or get connected with them in a relationship, they'll be hooked up with someone else, break your heart, and leave you wondering, well, I thought our relationship was deeper than that. See ya. Are you hearing me? Just, I, 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 there's some time to be, we'll laugh and have fun about avocados, but there's other times to be serious about relationships. Not everybody that's with you is for you. Not everybody that's with you is for you. You work on a job and a position comes open, you find out real quick, your buddy's at work, but now there's a position on the... Oh, wait a minute now. They'll dog you. They get their moment in the office with, with the superintendent... Hold on, no, he, uh, or she, uh, you just had dinner the other night. Can I get an amen? Comrades. They're not for you, nor are they for what you are for. They are just against what you're against. I'm really not into sports like I used to be. I used to really be in sports. I used to have a team I follow, and now and then I will check and see what's going on. But we've got nothing to brag about, and I say this with all shame and humility. But as a as as a an o, a Oakland, not even Oakland anymore, Oakland Raider fan, if I see a Raider emblem, we have a connection. But it's not we're for the same things. We're just against the Kansas City Chiefs, the Denver Broncos, and the San Diego Chargers. Can I get an amen? If you tell me your football team, I can tell you who you're against. But that doesn't mean we're for the same thing. Are you hearing me? It's just, I'm wanting to help you here for a minute. Mm -hmm. You're an acquaintance. They are only the enemy of your enemy. That is it. The enemy of my enemy is not really my friend. And so you will team up and you'll Fight a greater enemy. They will only be with you until the victory is accomplished. They're kind of like scaffolding. And all the ministry people, oh, now you're out, now you're awake. Scaffolding is only there until the building is built. 
but it's later removed because the building's completed and it's gone. Don't be upset when scaffolding leaves. Don't be upset when comrades leave. They're not supposed to be there and remain there anyway. Don't tell your dream to constituents. They'll never try to help you fulfill your dream. In fact, they may take your dream and try to go take it and do it themselves. They'll be like, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I do that? Don't tell your dream to comrades because they'll not support you. Because they're not for you in the first place. Are you hearing me? You have to be real about this. If you find just a few people in your entire life with whom you can share your dream with, you're a blessed person. You need to thank God that you've got a few people that you can have that kind of relationship with. I can give you an idea how to identify people and who they really are for you. If they're really for you, they'll weep with you when you weep. They will rejoice when you rejoice. They will be involved where you're involved. They will be concerned about what concerns you. They will go all in to help you with your cause. Mm -hmm. They will be upset with what upsets you. They, they, they will be upset at folks who hinder you. They, they will be with, they'll be one of those that helps you because they're for you. That's how you tell what kind of friends you have. Next time you have something good happen, go, go tell that somebody the good news and settle down for a minute and watch their reaction. Because if they're not truly happy for you, just go ahead and hold your peace. Walk back out the door. They're not a confidant. They're not someone you can trust with your dream. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm trying to get real here with some of you. You know, I'm, I said this, I'll say it before. Everybody will want you to do well, just not better than them. That humanity, that pride gets in our way. Because when people really connect with you, they'll be happy for you when you share your dreams. The psalmist tells us in Psalms 56 and 9, listen, when I cry unto thee, then shall my enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. You need to take that one to the bank. You may not understand how faithful God is, but if you will turn and make him your confidant, you'll find out God is for you. Walking with God will benefit you. Having a relationship with God is going to be the best one you could ever have. If you've ever had anybody come into your life to help you, you need to thank God that he sent somebody. Many times when you pray to God, he'll send somebody. Don't sweat those folks who leave. Don't sweat those folks uh, 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 that maybe God even removed from your life. Don't, don't worry about them folks that leave. Don't, don't worry about those in the comrade zone. You need to be focusing on those walking with God folks. He'll send those, those, those real friends. Out. They're concerned about your life, concerned about your ministry. They're concerned about your walk with God. He'll, he'll send you those. Jesus even said in Matthew 12 and 30, he that is not with me is against me. Let that sink in when it comes to salvation. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. If you're not with Jesus and if you're not gathering the church, you're at odds with the king of kings and the Lord. You, see, and being involved in, in all the stuff in the world is not wrong unless it keeps you from gathering. Unless it keeps you from walking with him. Because you're not walking with him, you're against him. That's what he just said. And if you're not gathering, you're scattering. You're getting people sidetracked with all your junk, your proclivities, your habits, and your hobbies are pulling people away from me. Jesus teaches us who's for us. God's for us. Aristotle said we have three types of friends in a philosophical discussions of friendship. It's common to follow Aristotle in distinguishing three kinds of friendship. Friendships of pleasure, friendships of utility, and friendships of virtue. Even Aristotle understood the progression. 2 Corinthians 6.14, and be not unequally yoked together with unbelief. 
for what fellowship with righteousness with unrighteous. And let, let me say it an easier way. Listen, you don't want your spouse hanging out with someone who you don't believe in marriage. So you don't want your family hanging out with someone that don't believe in God. Is that simple enough? That's what that's saying. And what communion has light with darkness? 2 Corinthians 6.14. It says in, in, in another version, the temple of the living God. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. But what partnership? Everybody say partnership. Has righteousness with lawlessness, lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Hear me on this. Don't, don't, don't turn me off. Hear me on this, church. This concept relates to dating, marriage, business ties, social connections, friendships. Romans tells us in 6.17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine or teaching which ye have learned, and avoid them. If someone ain't aligning, if someone assures you, well, the pastor says this, but we really don't. Mark them. The Bible says this, but ah, we don't. Oh, that, that, that's harsh. You're judging them. Exactly. Where did the concept go from not judging? Not the Bible. They try to say the Bible says that. But I'm going to say, it says, judge not lest you be judged. It says, judge ye a righteous judgment. It doesn't say not to judge. It says to judge correctly. Hello? Remember that restaurant I talked about? You walked in, you could smell the food poisoning. It doesn't matter how good that looks on the plate. It's not about the presentation. It's about what it produces. And I won't go into those details. James 4 and 4. Listen, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Too many of us having too much fun. Too many of us are connected to the wrong things. Too many of justify our worldliness and our carnality. And we don't analyze our, our lack of worship. And how much like Christ we look like. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Listen to this. This is scary. It'll get fun here in a minute. These six things that the Lord hate, you need to listen. Yes, seven are abomination unto him. A proud look. Guilty. I'll do that because some of you ain't. That'd be painful to admit. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. You lied on someone. You did something. We say we wouldn't have, but we all would have yelled crucify. We all would have screamed, but give me Barabbas. In fact, to deny that is to say, you know what, I'm all in with Jesus. I have nothing to do with the world. But we're all calling Bar Abbas. Bar Abbas, son of the father. Your father, the devil, not our heavenly father. See, when you choose the things of the world and you choose carnality, you're choosing Bar Abbas. Maybe that's too much for some of you right now. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. Yeah, you do. You think those little things. You play a little manipulating game. You talk to those who cause discord, and you're, you're friends with them and friends here, and you do. God knows. Feet that be swift and running mischief. Oh, yeah. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that sow discord among the brethren, the church. This is serious stuff. Enoch voluntarily walked away from others. So that he could walk with God. He walked away from others so that he could walk with. He walked away from things that he could walk away and walk with the Creator. He walked away from stuff so that he could clearly walk with the King of Kings. And he was certain about his consecration, his testimony. He pleased God. You see, we live in a world, please yourself. 
I like this, I like that, I want this, I want that. It's going to be hard to please God with that type of ideology. Like David, I will walk in thy truth, Psalms 86 and 11. Like Micah, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever, 4 and 5. There's going to be obstacles. There's going to be, listen, this world isn't going to make it easy to walk away from it. It feels so good to get accolades. It feels so good to have a couple of thousand friends hitting like on the dinner that you had. It feels so good and you get your affirmation from everywhere. Your kids love on you when you do all those worldly things and they bag on you when you drop them to church. There's going to be obstacles and setbacks and sufferings. But be assured that walking with God is a walk of victors. There's going to be a day come when all this stuff gets placed in the right balances. Some are going to be found wanting and some are going to be around the throne worshiping. Listen, consecration to con consecration to sanctification to holiness. If you're going to have an intimate relationship with the Lord, you have to learn to enjoy and desire what he enjoys and desires. You ladies understand that one. Esther teaches us that one. She went and got dressed in a certain way. You know she put the right perfume on. We was on the way to church. I'm sorry, Sister Curl. I tell too much sometimes. We're on the way to church. All of a sudden, she goes, oh, man. I'm like, okay, we got to go back for something. I forgot to put my perfume on. Well, I, I'm like, that's cool. Ain't no one supposed to be sniffing you but me anyway. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. What God makes important and a priority, we must hold as important and a priority. Anything else, and we're sending mixed messages. We're sending confusion. We're the author of confusion. Enoch, he was cautious about his callings. We know that Lot, as an example, chose foolishly. He chose Sodom. He lost his heart, his home, his family, his happiness, his spirituality. I'm sure at first observation, Lot looked like he had the world by the tail. He chose well. He was known. Everybody knew. He was the big man on campus. Everybody knew who he was. He was known in the gate. He was affluent. He had some stuff. He, he had influence, but in the end, that tragedy of unintended consequences of his personal proclivities ultimately cost his wife, his children, their souls. Lot, it looked good on the outside, but look where it led your wife. Look where it led you and your children because he never really developed a personal relationship with God on the level of pleasing God over self. He could never attain where Abraham did. He didn't think about what Enoch had done. He was so busy going on the superficial things of life that he missed the most important thing in life. Listen, each and every one of us has certain callings. You have gifts. You have abilities and talents that God has given you. Some of you are artistic. Some of you can sing. Some of you have things you don't even realize you have yet. Maybe, maybe you kind of know, but we don't know yet. And it's right there. But ultimately, your calling is determined by your decision yes. towards God's promptings and drawings. You can throw yourself into a, in a hobby or, or a habit. You can throw yourself into those things. And I get it. But the question is, are you compelled to please God or are you compelled to please self? Because God desires to be a confidant, not a comrade. Proverbs 3 and 6 says, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. I don't know about you. The fact that the Lord wants to direct my paths, the fact that I know that he can give me the map of where, I don't know about you, but do you ever go on a trip? Did you get that GPS because you want to know where you're going? You have a, I remember back in the day we had to unfold that map while we was driving. You know, you never get it back, fold back to, but you're looking on that map. I remember printing out pictures Back in, in, back in the early 2000s, before we had access to all this. Remember those big GPS units you'd be able to plug in and follow? I was so glad. I remember grabbing about three or four of those things and throwing them away. I was so glad because it was all on my phone. 
God direct my path. Some people used to call them the GPS God positioning system. I need that in my heart. I need that in my spirit. I need that with thy word. Romans 8 and 31. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Why wouldn't I want to walk with God? Why wouldn't I? He's for me. All these things that I've been involved, I've never seen one hobby or a habit ever be for me. I've watched it drain me. i watched it consume my mind, my heart, and my money. But I've had a God that wants to walk with me, that wants to give, that wants to bless, that wants to leave in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Can I say this? Can I address this this morning? It's time the world of darkness recognizes you and I and what we are. It's time we live in a way where we stand up and shine as beacons in the night, showing the way to truth and righteousness. It ought to be time that we finally decide, I'm going to lay aside all the sin and the weights that's so easy. I want to walk with God. I want to have my hands securely in his and know that he can order my steps. I, I'm tired of half measures and not knowing what saith God or what the spirit does here or there. Acts 16, and it came to pass as he went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by Sue, saying, the same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God. which show unto us the way of salvation. And she did this many days. The enemy ought to know who you are. You ought to be living in such a way that you're turning the enemy into a fit. That you're caused, and there ought to be some evil things coming out of the woodwork messing with you because you are pointing the way. There ought to be something about you that you're pointing the way to salvation. You're, you're, some of us talk about religion. We talk about scripture. We talk about what we believe, but there ain't nothing following you. There's nothing demonstrating that, that, that you are a child of the most high God. You ought to be upsetting all hell. You ought to be displacing something. You ought to be causing the divination. Wow, well, I know Paul, Jesus, I know Paul. I, know. I don't want that to be me. You better know who I am. Paul, being grieved, turned and said, Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out. Do you realize what she was saying was true? But the spirit behind it was wrong. Just because you spark a little truth out now and then. Is the spirit behind what you're saying right? The world needs to know who we are with the undeniable proof in the footsteps of our life. There's a story of a man named Peter Jenkins. I'm getting ready to close. In 1973, he started to walk across America with his dog. He wanted to bring awareness to the amazing country that we have here in America. He walked some 5,000 miles from New York to Oregon. It took him nearly six years. During that six-year journey, not only weather and storms and mountains and valleys and roads and pathways, he was mugged and robbed three different times. Brother Lulu, he was stabbed once. He was hit by a car, and his dog was killed by another car. After this long journey, he was interviewed and asked the question, was there ever a time when you just wanted to quit walking? He said, yeah. The interviewer asked him, was it the mugging that made you want to quit, or the stabbing, or getting hit by the car, or the death of your dog? He said, no. None of those things made me want to quit. The interviewer was perplexed and he said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Then what was it that made you want to quit walking? He said, well, none of those big things. He said, it's when I got sand or a pebble in my shoes. You see, when you get something in your shoes, it affects the way you walk. 
it affects each step. It makes each step painful. It makes each footstep unpleasant. It irritates you. Every step becomes a problem. Makes the journey uncomfortable. It doesn't take a lot of sand, but just a little bit of sand in your shoes will cause a, a blister or an irritation on your foot to appear. A little sand in your shoes has a potential to cause life-changing scenarios in your life because of the way you have to walk. And Sand's cool on the beach. Whenever we're able to, I love to go visit my in-laws. I don't have outlaws. I got wonderful in-laws. I love my I love I love my mom and dad on my wife's side. They're amazing, wonderful people. I like the fact when we go there, we get to, my wife and I get to go sit on the beach. It's romantic. It's relaxing. And I hope she likes it as much as I do. But ultimately, anybody ever remember when you got done at the beach? Walking back. Now, you know you're not putting them in the car. And so they have those stations where you wash your feet off. You ever done that? Or for those people that actually went in the surf and swam, you need to take those showers. You know, you see the YouTube videos where the guys reach over and put the shampoo in the guy. You ever <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. That's just that's a Steve Crowism right there. And Ezekiel's laughing. That's good. And so you go there and you wash one foot off and you put it down, wash the other, and you realize you've gotten the sand off of here, but now you got sand on the bottom of your feet. You see. It's not going to be the big things that the devil uses to affect you. Some of you, you're never going to be guilty of murder. You're not going to commit adultery or fornicate. You're not going to do those things. It's not the obvious thing the devil uses. But it can wear you out with the sand and the pebbles. If you can get you jaded and upset and sideways and a little, just a little bit uncomfortable. And well, you just take the things of God. Well, my feet hurt. I'm irritated. Every step seems to bother me. And it's not because you've done anything wrong. You've just never taken the time to get your feet clean. Just like Peter Jenkins, it wasn't the muggings or the stabbing, but the sand in his shoes. The Bible says in Songs of Solomon, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. See, the devil wants to destroy your walk with God. He will use the little things to destroy the relationship. He'll let you become bitter. You'll blame it on being tired or that you've been walking a long time. It's a little irritants that cause you to become dissipated towards God, the sand, the pebbles that steal the joy out of the journey. It affects how you see your brother and your sister. Mm -hmm. It'll affect your giving and your doing, especially around the church. You'll start looking at the church jaded. You'll start be looking at your brothers and sister jaded. And you say, I don't want to give that because I don't want... Anybody ever gave to a homeless person? Anybody ever gave, and but you want to give them food because you make sure they got what they got, or they said they wanted to go buy booze with it? Do you really think to God it means any different if you gave it to them and they bought booze with it? Do you think if, and thank God it's not this church, but if you gave money and someone went and did something wrong with it, do you think you're not still going to be aligned with giving properly? Do you think if you gave and someone did something wrong with it, God's still not going to say you still gave? If you gave to the homeless and they didn't do something right with it, are God going to look at you like you're dumb? No. Too many of us have got sand in our shoes and pebbles in there. And we don't serve God like we used to. We don't give like we used to. We don't love like we used to. We're jaded and we're justified, not because we're right, but because we have a wound or some pain or some hurt in the walk. And we've stopped allowing God to wash our feet. You see, he wants to steal your burden. 
rob your joy when it comes to the things of God. So he'll make you see everything wrong with the church. But you're still all in with a world that's going to hell in a handbasket. You've got your life full of that stuff. You're so invested. In it. You have no problem dropping a good dime on something of the world. Are you hearing me? The devil's not going to come at you with drugs and alcohol, pornography, adultery. No. Just those grains of sand irritate you. To take a good pillar in the church and get them jaded to where they could care less if they're really a part of what's going on or not. God, I've been asking for this. I haven't received it yet. And you become discouraged with the grain of sand. You, you thought you're going to be the one that got to be the, the next in that position, and they chose someone else. So now depression is the grain of sand or the pebble in your shoe. I, I'm not going to go back to that church because they don't appreciate me. It's those small pebbles of misunderstanding and depression that's affecting your walk. The sands of carnality that's stolen your worship. and You justify it with being tired. But when it comes to things of the world, you're tireless. It's those little irritants that have ripped off your prayer life. Are you hearing me? All of a sudden, the doctor says he sees something. And now the grain of fear, that little grain of fear, rips you and affects your walk. Your company says that, oh, we got a position available, overtime available, and that sand of greed. Now, if I can't make it, Pastor, I can't do that no more. I got to be here. I got to be there. Oh, wait a minute, the pastor, and, and trust me, if I don't speak to you on a Sunday morning, it affects me all week long. Because I know there are people, if I don't speak to them, he didn't speak to me. And those other little grains of sand that you get in your shoes, the ones of laziness. I don't have enough time for myself. Worried about things you have no control over. Lustful thoughts, gossiping, busybody, excessive television watching. I'm too tired to go to church. I can't go on Sunday night. Sunday school's too early. To, su Sunday school's for kids. I don't need to go. You might think it's a small thing, but I want you to watch this. Sand. Now, if there's someone sitting over there could tell you a whole lot about me, about more about it than I can, but sand can take the paint and rust off a car. You take a sandblaster, I'm telling you, you can strip and rip, and it can just, just obliterate something. Sand, a grain of sand, sand in your engine can destroy a perfectly good running engine. It might seem like a small thing right now. But slowly, that sand, that irritant, that pebble in your shoe or in your spirit is wearing away at you in your relationship with God. And it's affecting the way you walk. And you become justified. Yeah, we don't need to be there. It's just fellowship. I don't need to be a part of that. I'm not going to be. And the devil slowly calls you out like a lion does. Because he's really not ripping you out of the church. He's messing with you, walking with God. When you're walking with him, you're going to care about what he cares about. You're going to love what he loves. You're going to care about people. You're going to care about our teenagers. You're going to care about the church. You're going to care about what goes on. You're going to make sure someone's given. You're going to make sure the lights are on. And we, you're going to be a You're going to care. But like I said, most of you know when you leave the beach area, you get wash your shoes off. Try to wash yourself off. And now you're standing there and your feet are covered in sand again. It's nearly impossible to get the sand off your feet. Are you hearing me? So you're trying to rinse off that little, that extra sand of jealousy that's still there. You're trying to rinse off that sand of pride that's been stuck in there for so long. If I'm not going to get the accolades, I'm going to step back. If I'm trying to rinse off the sands of doubt, the sands of bad habits that are still there, you've been trying to rinse off the sand off your feet. Only every time you do it, you step back down. Sand on my feet. It's a beautiful place in Scripture. your walk with God. God never really designed you to wash 
your own feet. You need Christ to wash your feet. You have to allow your brothers and sisters to wash your feet. Don't, don't ever think that you can, don't need the church. First Peter 5 says, casting all your care upon him for he careth to you. John chapter 3 said, if I then your Lord and master have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. I am responsible for the irritants and the pebbles and the struggles of my brother and my sister. I am responsible to make sure that you are felt loved and cared for. And those irritants that come, let me wash my brother's and my sister's feet. Let me wash my, some of you have stuff. You, 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 you need to get back to washing feet. And when you get back to washing feet and involved in care, you're gonna find someone's taking care of your feet. Oh, I don't know if you'll get this in the spirit, but I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords Church. He said, if I wash your feet, you ought to wash one another. Oh, I care about my, you need the church. You need your church family. I need my brothers. I need my sisters. I need you to help me walk this walk, lest I get an irritant, a pebble, or sand that caused me to stumble. We need our elders. We need our Sunday school teachers. We need our ministers team. We need our musicians and our say thank you for putting out the effort and singing so we need the evangelists. Thank you, Brother Felty and Brother Baca and those men to get the cup. Hey, but we even need the pastor now and then to preach honestly. Maybe it's time to take that shoe off and dump it out and let some brother or sister here rub on you and wash your feet and let you know you matter. We care. Let me help you walk a little closer to Jesus. Let me help you walk a little closer to the Word of God. Let's get hand in hand and let's get the glory together. I need a relationship with God. My relationship with God can't be any more better than my relationship with my brothers. And my sister, I need to be in partnership with God. Ecclesiastes 4 9, as we stand. Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he hath not another to help him up. If you're walking with God, you're never alone. Romans tells us, Romans tells each and every one of us. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, and we know that he is. If God be for us, everybody say, that's a partnership. I'm telling each and every one of you right now, God wants to be in partnership with you. He wants to walk step for step, stride for stride with you. Who can be against you? Oh, if you'll start walking with God like never before, then nothing, you're not alone in this world. We're in a relationship and a partnership with God. Our God has never lost a battle. Our God has never had a small beat. He's got a great, he's got a better job. He's got a better house. He's, if you'll walk with him, he's got healing and help. God will not position you for failure. Will you give me one minute right here? What time is that? Okay. See, I want to say, God will not position you for failure. But you will. Lot thought everything looked good, but he positioned himself for failure because he wouldn't follow the man of God. In. Hey, Abraham is following. You, you look out throughout scripture. Don't think you know better. You are not the, you are not going to be that one clairvoyant one. I don't have to do anything God says and I'm still going to make it. Hello, teenager. If you, if you don't want to fall in the footsteps of getting pregnant out of wedlock and having to just, just completely dissolve all your college and education dreams and your career, then don't do what they're doing. If you don't want to mess up your life with drugs and alcohol, don't hang around those that do. And if there are people sitting in here saying, you don't need the church, then they're telling you you don't need to go to heaven. You ought to have enough gumption. I'm your friend. And be like Jesus. He loved Peter. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou savest not the things that be of God. There ought to be enough about each and every couple in here that you'd love your spouse enough. Wait a minute, babe. You're not talking right. Hey, hey, hey honey, I love you. I'm, I'm
I thank God for a praying wife. See, y'all don't even understand. I got a, a wife that actually not only reads the Bible, but understands it pretty good. Hello? You see, little lady not named Abigail was married to a jerk. He was just, Randy, he was, he was one of those jerks. And he didn't realize his mouth was spouting off. And he was, he was cursing himself and his wife freaked out. Oh my God, I got to do something. This is my husband. And she went, we, she went in the kitchen, and I know that offends some of y'all, but she went in the kitchen, boy, and she got out of They just made a whole bunch of good old vittles. And she went running to the king who was coming to deal with that joker. And she stayed the, the wrath of the king. Now, he still got dealt with because he didn't learn. But that does not absolve one of us, brothers, to take care of one another. Listen, you're doing wrong here. You'll bring in the wrath of the king on you. God loves you today. God wants to be in each and every one of you. Even if your family don't want to live for God, you can call out on God. Right, He will walk you. There's a maid that walked with God, even though she was in captivity, that led Naaman to be healed. I'm telling you, God wants to walk with you today. I was a busted up teenager. Wounded. Bitter and broken. Involved in drugs and alcohol. My best. Oh, I was a mess. Someone knocked on our front door and told me, man, your dad was just killed. I'm like, what? Sure enough, I lost my dad that day. I was angry. Hateful. I threw myself into all sorts of stuff. I've killed myself multiple times. I wasn't in war, but any, anybody ever been shot at? You'll find out who you really are when you hear the ting, ting. Ting. Yeah, you know real quick. You, you ain't all bad when that starts happening. It'll change the way you think. You think you're bad till that happens. I'll fuck. Fist of cuffs is nothing. Hand wet ain't nothing. But when you hear that, that's what you call pucker time right there. But I'm thankful that that day that I called out to God, through all that mess, he heard me. God sent someone into my life to help me get that partnership with God. God will never position you for failure if you will yield yourself to him. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 24, for the Lord your God is he that goeth with you. Everybody say, he's with me. To fight for you against your enemies, to save you. God wants to fight your enemy. Will you get in partnership and release him to do so? Isaiah 54 and 70. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Everybody say, that's a partnership. Let that sink in. Don't let those little irritants, those little issues of your mind, your feet, keep you from walking with God. Luke 10 and 19 says, Behold, I give unto you a power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You can go through some things, but when you're walking with God, you'll come through that thing. I'll come out on the other side. It's absolutely the plan of God to work with you and I. He wants to be with you, to work with you in a holy relationship and partnership to facilitate the victory in your life and in your church. You need to start expecting God is going to enable, empower, and anoint you and your family to walk with him, to reach our, our families and our community. I guess what I've really come to say this morning to all those that'll hear me.
it's time to raise our level of expectation. It's time that we become a truly end time people in an end time church. A time to start praying those great prayers of faith. Not those just bless me through the day. Oh, just let me have five bucks here. Or let me get another hobby here, another product. Oh, God, it's time to make great declarations of faith to be involved in the greatest thing that's going on in the world right now. And that's the calling of the church. It's time to walk in great faith and have great Results, it's time for marriages to come together stronger than that. Families to be bound together and knit together because the Spirit of God is walking among them. Family, friends, co-workers will be coming to God when we go all in. Let me tell you something about the nature of God. He doesn't let us down. If you give yourself to Him, He will not let you down. He will not fail you. Second right. right. Peter 2, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. To... What's God saying? I don't want no one lost. I don't tell your neighbor, he don't want you lost. He don't want you lost. Matthew 14 and 17 7 says, For that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The greatest solution to remove the sand is the prayer of repentance. Make no mistake about it, the hour that we live in, it is absolutely the desire and the will of God. And I'm going to say something to blow your mind. That Everyone in the world, it is the will of God that everyone in the world is filled with the Holy Ghost. Evidence speaking of that, it is his will. Mark 16, 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. It says in Acts 2 and 39, for the promises unto you and to your children, all that are far off, even. Can I tell you, God wants to save everybody. Can I tell you, God wants to walk with you and be in partnership with you right now. God's not against your home. He's not against your life. He's not against you. God is for you. Will you walk with him? God is for you. Will you walk with him? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism unto death. That like as of Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk. If you paid attention to Brother Ezekiel last Sunday night, in newness of life. Time to let go of the oldness. Some of us got old in our faith. Some of us got old in our mentality. Some of us have forgotten to allow God to bring newness. Uh, and you're stuck in the sands of time. You're stuck with old sand in your shoe. It's time to take that shoe off. Empty it out and say, God, cleanse my mind and my feet of the debris I've allowed to collect and cause me to walk in bitterness and stumble over the smallest things. For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall... Also, in likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we should henceforth not serve sin. God put this in motion. God wants to work with you. God wants to, 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 to walk with you. God is not restrained in this matter. If there's someone here today, Somebody ready to leave the past behind and walk in newness to, to give God an opportunity. I don't know about you, but I know where my help comes from. I know where my strength comes from. I know, I know in whom I believed. You see, I know some of you sit there, financial struggle, health situations, all kinds of problems. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God, 
Anybody want to walk with God today? Anybody want to walk and get the impossibilities to become possible? Who's ready to dust some sand off and get walking with God like never before? Who's ready? God is just looking for someone willing, someone ready to walk daily with him. And I close with this. By faith, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony. Not that he called fire down from heaven. Not that he preached a great message on a Sunday morning. He never sang at the Grand Ole Opry or Madison Square Garden. He had this testimony that he pleased God. What a testimony. There's no limit what God could do in this hour for you.